We're going to be doing uh, the variant annotation package today. Um, we're not going to work directly with our genotypes at, at Lieber, but I think as an R package, this is probably the best equipped to handle our genotype information. And so we'll just be going through, um, they kind of have a workflow that I, that I linked in the Slack channel. And we'll be going through that. And um, the, the hope is, it, there's kind of a lot here, but my hope is that by the end of this, we can read a VCF and the R in an efficient manner. Okay, so here's our packages we need. Um, if anybody needs time to download those, let me know. Okay. So within, within our kind of library um, data, we have this, this VCF we're calling FL for now. Now in normal, um, if we were reading in the Weber data, it'd be like RBCF, GZ here. Um, but you can, you can use just R objects that are in BCF format. And so we're going to use this read dot BC or read BCF function. And that takes a variant call um, format file and turns it into an R data object. And so we can kind of get a feel for this. It's almost like a range summarized experiment object in a way. I guess it doesn't have call data, but our, it has our row ranges. There's an info field. The info field is almost like metadata. So the accuracy, the call rate, um, and, and other allele specific or not a wheel specific, but kind of, yeah, I guess metadata. Um, Gino, Gino has three, um, three fields, uh, genotype, which is GT, dosage, which if the data is imputed, dosage is a kind of a best, or a statistical estimate of the genotype. So it's, it's continuous, it's not one or zero or two. And GL, and I am forgetting what GL is. Um, oh, genotype likelihoods, genotype likelihoods. Um, and so these are really our, our data matrices in, in the case of ours, um, our data is almost all dosage at Weber um, because most of it's imputed. Um, we can look at the header of a VCF. So every VCF has, has starter lines. Our headers at Weber also have um, it's almost like a track record history of every time BCF tools is run, there's a, there's a section of the header that that line gets stored in. So you can kind of, you can view that to also look at and confirm um, if this is the most updated. But what's valuable here is the header also stores the samples. And so this is an easy way to look at, okay, we're, we're working with five samples here. Um, this is a relatively small BCF. And, and so a lot of the problems that we would normally have don't really apply to this BCF because it is small. Um, and I think, I think the only answer I have, and we'll get to this later is, um, me and Luis were talking about this is like the, the inaccessibility, right? 
This works with this because it's one chromosome and five samples, but at Libre we have 2,500 samples and 300 million SNPs on RBCF and, and just doesn't read in. Um, they do have a filtering option um, that we'll get into that will let you call the BCF in by row ranges and samples. And so that's, that's the only I, I thing I can think would help. Um, I just don't think we'll ever really be able to get that BCF into you know, our environment though. But anyways, so this function geno comes back to this geno field and allows you to access that as, um, as its own object. So then we can look at this. We can see the data types, a string, strip, float, and a float. And each has a description here. And then we can look at the row ranges. Most of you are probably familiar with, uh, with how row ranges are set. Um, actually looking at this, I kind of thought about it and um, I'd wondered if I, uh, so here they have the RSID just as the ID connecting the row ranges. And I'm thinking maybe that would be better in the future for RBCF, but I don't know, food for thought. Because right now we just have like a concatenated ID. Um, but yeah, this is, this is just like a range summarized experiment almost. Um, and it works in a very similar way um, that you can subset the data. What is REF? Oh wait, yeah, I know what this is. This is our, so for each a wheel, you have a reference and an alternate snip. And so what you're doing here is you're getting, for the first five snips, what is the reference allele? And here we can see it's A, C, G, G, C, C. And then we can look at the quality for those calls. And uh, you can see it's, uh, what is, let me look at what the actual metric is here. But I'm assuming no documentation. Class extended from Oh, qual is an entire field. Okay. And so just like we're calling Gino, we're getting an entire field here of quality scores. I see. Gotcha. Okay, and the same here, um, we can call the alternate wheel um, with the alt function. Um, we're going to start to go more through, let me scroll down a bit. We're going to start to go more through, uh, parsing the genotypes. And first we can look at, at the class. So each of these is a matrix. Um, 
where across the top is the sample and down the side is the snip. And if, uh, do I show it here? Yeah, I think I do for dosage. Um, okay. So something like that. And in the case of dosage, it doesn't have to be a one or zero. Um, it could be anywhere along the span because it's a, a statistical likelihood being called. You can also see that this is fairly sparse. Um, and so that's something to consider as well. And, and we can um, look at that more later here with this five num call. Are you guys familiar with the five num function? Okay. It's a, uh, shoot. It's like, it's almost like summary. We just did summary. Um, you see the spread here is, is predominantly at zero. And that would just mean the allele just isn't present in that sample. Um, and you get a peak at, at the max of two. And so we, we can look more at the distribution here. So which, what percent of our calls are, are zero or absent? And, and so in our, in our matrix, 86% of our data is absent or not absent, but the, oh, the wheel isn't there. It's our, uh, it's the, I guess, so there's a minor and major wheel, right? And if it's the major wheel, it's zero. And in this case, 86% of the time, it's the reference wheel. And so we can look at the distribution here of our, of our data to see kind of how our dosage calls did. Now, in, a, in an ideal, there's really only three options for a call. Zero, in which case it's reference, reference. One, reference, alternate, and two, alternate, alternate. Um, and so we'd like to see clusters around those three options. And if we make a histogram of our data here, um, we can see that. Uh, I dropped the zeros here because if I didn't, it would have skewed the entire graph. But uh, we can see that we cluster predominantly at one, two, and zero uh, with a lot of spread in here. And this is kind of, you'd wanna keep an eye on this because having a call of like 0.5 isn't good. That you really shouldn't have that level of uncertainty. And so we can dig deeper into kind of like what is driving, driving this region of, of some kind of ambiguous calls. And we can look at the info field. And what we have here, the main one we use at Weaver is called RSQ. Um, this is an empirical number from imputation. And what it does is really, it, it calculates a linear regression. Um, it, it's an accuracy metric where it's calculating a regression from permutations of the imputation. So how many times would we get the same call if we re-imputed this? And how much does it correlate with itself? So you can see this first one is fairly high, 98. 
And when we get down to the third one, we are already at a 60% call rate. So 40% of the time, it's, it's calling a different allele when you re-impute it. Um, at really, most of the papers I've read have a cutoff of 98. So even this would be on the cusp of, of not being used. But we can look and see if there's some kind of uh, bias on a smaller scale. So we, we're going to download the dbSNP database. Uh, here, we're labeling the seek levels so that we can subset later to um, to just chromosome 22. And then we're subsetting, we're creating an index to see um, how many of our RSIDs are in the DB SNP. database. And it's about 40% are, and roughly 62% are not annotated in the dbSNP database. Um, we kind of talked about this before, but, or I guess we used to talk about it, where like unannotated SNPs tend to have a bias for being less studied. And there tends to be and this is just my own personal, what I've heard is it tends to be less reliable um, in some sense, if, if it's less known. Um, and so we can investigate that in a way here to see if our annotated SNPs here are more accurate than our unannotated. And so there's our, there's our header again of our info field. We're going to take this info field and take the quality score of every SNP in dbSNP. What is VT? Oh, variant type. And so, yeah, we're just turning our essentially our info field into a data frame here for the SNPs we just found. And so we can look at. And now we have we have a a index here, which will be easy to make a graph with for whether it was in dbSNP or not. OK, so now we can make a GG density plot of uh, kind of the accuracy distribution with this RSQ and separating by the fill of whether it was annotated or not. What you can see in the blue here is for those annotated, we get a really good call. We've got a peak around like 90 plus, 95 plus. Um, for those unannotated, it, there's a much wider distribution into, into lower RSQs. Um, and I can only guess why that would be. It's uh, may, maybe they're less known and less studied. And so we don't entirely have the imputation algorithm down quite yet for those SNPs. But uh, yeah, so we, we kind of see 
that there's there's kind of a bias um, in the imputation for annotated SNPs here. That this would be interesting to look at with our data as well. Um, and we can kind of do this. I'm interested to see the other metrics as well. Um, We just plug and chug here. Yeah, it looks like both of them peak right at a hundred for quality. Um, And we do get a different distribution again. This isn't as pretty, but we do get a different distribution again with, uh, with the LDAF. That's interesting. All right, but anyways, so now the next section is really talking about um, subsetting and how we can use the, the G ranges and I ranges to subset by region. Um, or even by feature name. Um, and making this object actually can be used to read in the, the VCF. So in this case, if, if this is all we wanted to look at, we could actually read in the Libra data probably um, for this region. Uh, and so if there's specific regions people wanted to look at, that would be a functional solution to kind of our data crunch problem. So we get our range here, our chromosome 22, start, end, and we're looking for these two specific genes. And uh, so here, Originally, when we read this in, it had a path. If we look at FL, it has an accompanying path to a, to a tabx file. So if we look at tab. And this indexes our VCF by rows. So now, when we read this in, we can specify the tabx file, the build, and our ranges, and we get a specific subset for the BCF. So this is the same format as our last one, but much smaller. Uh, let's see. If we do like versus, yeah. So now we have a much more manageable subset of calls from a region of interest. Okay. Hey, Josh. We can look at our row ranges here. And uh, kind of see, I guess you guys are all familiar with range summarize experiment, so. You probably know. All right, so now we're going to read in the header as its own object off of this. And this is actually an S4 object as well, where because it's not 
the header isn't formatted as a data frame, so it stores different fields differently in, um, in an S4 object. But we can subset those fields. And uh, look at the different fields that we can explore. And so here we can subset Okay, so now we're creating almost an index. So if we look at this, we're subsetting for a field, for two fields. We want the genotypes and within the info section, we want the allele frequency. And so I wonder what, what this object actually looks like. Okay, and so when this reads in, it's not going to read in the entire VCF. And instead of subsetting by row ranges, it's going to subset by the two fields we asked to. And this, this could also kind of be a solution to our memory problems. Um, because as you, as you can see over here, our original VCF was 10 megabytes. And we've reduced this to 1.9 megabytes. And we still have all of what we would need here with the genotype information for most analysis. Josh, can you use this to do like allele frequency too? Um, like, is and there... as you see here, oh, wait. this is a big area hey. <laughs> where it's like redundant data. And I kind of doing this step, I, I realized this is uh. Oh, I'm not in Gypsy, that's why. Um, this is all essentially just the same data. Like this is just the hard calls. Genotypes are just the hard calls of the dosage where it's like one hotted. So if it's a 0.9, oh, sorry, I didn't see the chat. I cannot hear Louise. Okay. <laughs> hey, can you hear me now? Give me one sec. I can't hear anyone. Oh, shoot. My, my speaker is down. <laughs> yeah, okay. no worries. Uh, um, I was going to ask using that like param filtering for mm -hmm. like reading in. Can you use that to do like more complicated asks? Like, um, so like we filter for like a little frequency, like, can you do that with that param or is it like, I think so. You know, have to define I like a less so. than. You could make like a specific argument. I don't have an example of that here. And that's a very good question, but I think you could. Like I almost think for ours, you could do something like. Something like that. I'm not sure if that's exactly how you would do it, but is that mm -hmm. kind of what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, like, um, thinking to how like we've used that for like e EQTLs, like for projects in the past, it's like um, we got a subset to all of that. So like, if we wanted to use the big data, um, mm -hmm. I don't know. It would make it easy to do like just an R rather than using like Plink. But I guess uh, that, or or if you wanted to do like a little side analysis without making whole new VCFs. You could do yeah, that. yeah. I mean, this would kind of make redundant, like, right, we have a VCF for every MAF we have. And so that would kind of make it easier to use for sure. Yeah. You know, I, I have a follow-up somewhat mm -hmm. related question. Can you yeah. like load in a specific SNP? Like if you're doing like a box bot, you don't want to load in the whole thing. You're actually- yeah. Yeah, you can. Um, so up here in the row range is example. Um, let's see if we do 
had let's see. I think it's here in the names. If you if you specify an RS ID or whatever ID your specific VCF uses, um, it can uh, just read in that SNP. So let's see here. You have a lower, you had a lowercase r. Oh, thanks. Still now. Um, how did we do this before? Oh, it's got to be bro ranges. What am I doing? So yeah, the question is, how would you specify this in, in G ranges? Because then you could just call it by RSID. Um, I mean, I guess you could just do like the specific seek name with the range, right? And that would get it. But I, I have to believe there's a way to just name the SNP and just call in one. Nice. No problem. Let's see, where were we? We were making. Okay, so for here, what this is doing is we're taking our ranges where we're making an index that combines the two. So we want the allele frequency and the genotype, but only for the previous ranges we said. And that creates an index for us that will subset even further. What does seek levels do? I think I understand what it's doing there, but I don't, I'm not familiar with the function. Okay, so it's just renaming the, the sequence levels to chromosome 22. So this, um, this here is from, um, what we're gonna do is get just the coding variance is that from the just checking what package that's from yeah it's from variant annotation and um so from the tx database we can cross reference these and get just the coding variance within this region And so we get a row ranges here of, of coding variants. We have the location, which appears to be just type. And now maybe that's another subset that could be valuable is 
is just reading in by like coding variants, or maybe you're interested in introns or extons. All right, I want to, I guess, take a minute. Does anybody have any questions? I can't see you guys. Not a question per se, mm -hmm. more like a comment. Mm -hmm. Normally when I want to do like a variant annotation, I want a summary of all variants from a list. It might not be in a VCF format, but even if you can convert it to a VCF format, is there like a way or are we going to get to, you're going to get there where you get an output of there are a percentage number of coding variants, there are a percentage number of frame shifts and stuff like that. Like in, like. Um, I think for today, like, and maybe this was our, a little niche, but for what we do, this package is mostly important because it can parse a VCF into the environment. Um, they do have tutorials to do exactly what you were saying. I don't know that we're going to get there. Yeah. Um, yeah, we normally just use Tabex on the command line to parse big mm. PCFs and big files or a plank if we're about to, the plank files, if we're going to like plot or interact. But yeah. There's some interesting stuff in here. This is probably the fact that we're, we are an R-based lab and reading things into R is not fun sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, it's <laughs> <laughs> it still but, takes some time, but so much yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's probably fair. But uh, I guess for, for like something like the plot we showed earlier, right? I wouldn't know how to do that command line. And so having the object actually be an R is uh, is just like more familiar with my skill set to throw up a GG plot. I, I wouldn't know how to produce that from Plink per se. Um, all right. And so we can, we can check if any coding variants match more than one gene okay, with a simple um, split and table function. And 15 did, and I have no idea why that would happen. Um, but Kynan or Leo, do you have any idea how a coding variant matches two genes. Is it just in like linkage disequilibrium to two? Uh, variants, the variants can affect multiple genes. They can ask, oh, say, okay. they can affect, especially if like, here's a, a, a cool example. If they're in like an up, a transcription binding site, that's gonna F up like a whole region of genes. Uh, so yeah, that, that's why we're, when you look at when you look at your like EQTL results, you'll see variants that are affecting multiple genes, which is why you're trying to figure mm. out. That's why we have to go in and do liquid disequilibrium because that could also be effect and do like the fine mapping to see which one of these variants are actually most likely affecting a specific gene. Uh. Gotcha. I didn't realize this was this was distance based. I thought it. I guess that's my error. I thought it was uh, like this variant is actually within this coding region, but it's it's in association or it's it's close. Is that the right understanding? But yeah, then I guess for this next region, we're taking a look at which coding variants or just summarizing them by gene ID. And really, I guess we only have three gene IDs in, in this. And you can see the distribution of variants associated with each.
Um, and so now this is just the, the transcript database object we inloaded. Uh, we're specifying Homo sapiens from that. And we're using predict coding. To create this object. Oh, so we're we're actually predicting amino acid changes for variants in a coding region. So that's kind of cool. Okay. Let me see if I can get this in a more aesthetically nice format. Okay. Um, and so I guess. Yeah, I guess it just adds a, almost a field to the row ranges of how the protein sequence would be altered. I'm not familiar enough with amino acids uh, to interpret that, but it seems valuable. And, and the so synonymous means nothing has changed. The non synonymous, that's when you might get a miss sis or a frame chip. Gotcha. Frame chip or something like that. So if it's synonymous, okay. that just means it changed, but it's actually the same amino acid. And then if it changed, it's a different amino acid, uh, non-synonymous. Okay, so maybe this would be something of interest if we did. Okay. So that, that's interesting. I feel like that could be useful in, in a sense of trying to identify variants. <laughs> yeah. All right, this was about as far as I thought we would get. And we're a little, a little ahead on time. Um, does anyone have any questions or anything specific we wanted to go through? no question per se but like a thought how mm -hmm. would you because like i noticed all this is i guess it's on an old m most of the G snips and stuff are on gt on the on 19 hg19 mm -hmm. how would you go about converting this to the hg38 because a lot of the sure um i mean kind of stuff is on hg38 but all the snip stuff is on hg19 but if you want to know how the snips are going to affect, would you convert it prior to putting it in here or would you want to convert it here? So our data, our data at Weber is all HD38 if it's, if it's outputted from the imputation. Um, you could do a lift over prior, that's less than ideal, um, but that's, I think if we were to use our actual data, like, are you saying if you had something you wanted to use and it was an HG19 and our data was an HG38, how you would kind of get between the two? Uh, no, just like your thought process on, because there's a lot, like the new, the like GWAS PG9. So like, if we're talking about the PG3 GWAS, that's on mm -hmm. HG19. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you wanted to look or like compare your variants to their variants, at some point you're going to have to switch it. Like our variants, which are on 38, which I appreciate, uh, mm -hmm. versus theirs. So like in Python, they've got a, a little pipe where you can do lift over using the UCF within the program. But I'm not familiar with R enough to know if they have like a lift over or if there's just some conversion because they there's so many packages in R that will convert 
that I just assume that there is something that will convert. I'm not sure if there, there's one in the program. It's been a while and maybe Leo knows, but I'm pretty sure there's a lift over package in R. Um, let me see. No. Leo, is that right? Is there a... <clears throat> um... I thought the BISNIP had the AG coordinates, AG theory coordinates of the variants. Yeah, that's what I've seen done in some old old code is that we use the dbSNP database to do it kind of manually. Um, but a long time ago, I'm pretty sure I've used a lift over function. I don't remember where it was <clears throat> where it's from, but mm -hmm. I'm pretty confident I have used the lift over function before in R. Um, They're just curious. This is one of those okay. things that people don't appreciate when we're working with data. It's like, oh yeah, we have to spend a while making sure the data sure. is on the same. But yeah, no. Thanks though. All right. Um, I guess I guess since we're in the questions, I could uh, stop recording. <laughs>